continuing on in this um, general theme of why we might do surveys and why we might want to resurvey re areas and follow up on surveys and what information we can gain through tracking diversity through time. I just want to talk about two research fronts to give you some ideas um, and then some of the data we'll talk about tomorrow, of course. So um, in 1997, it wasn't published until the year 2000, but in 1997, I had the pleasure of going to Aurora National Park on the east coast of Luzon Island in the northern Philippines. And I had basically eight days with a day on either end to do a short survey in this beautifully forested national park in the northern Philippines. Um, and we were so excited about the, the biodiversity in this area and um, this, the, the potential for discovery of new species and the, the just so well forested and intact communities that we wanted to publish a separate paper. And this is one of the first one of the first faunal papers that I wrote, just describing all the diversity of an area, providing photographs of all the species, just providing basically a, a, an inventory to the best of my abilities based on eight to 10 days um, for an area. And so we found about, what do we say, 19 species of amphibians, 30 reptiles, which included almost 20 uh, lizards, uh, one turtle, and 10 snakes over a period of um, that initial 10 days. And so here are the data from, or the initial um, species accumulation curves from that effort. Um, so this was a, again, 1997 early survey. Um, we, we basically had the, we developed our, um, or we restructured our, our sampling or our survey methods into 20 hour days. And we had groups, we had four people, and we went out for five hours a day. And we made sure that we did five hours a day and that we didn't do any more than five hours a day. And we just had 20 hour days. Um, and then we plotted by paying attention every day um, to what we, had what, what we had collected that day and the new species that we encountered, and we added them to our cumulative total. We had plotted these accumulation curves where we looked at the cumulative number of the species, the total number of species. This is the raw numbers of the species for um, frogs, lizards, and snakes, these three different curves, um, against the collecting effort of 10 days for 20 person hour days. So it was really simple. We didn't do anything special with the data. We just looked at the relationship between the numbers of species accumulated, the cumulative total, and the, the days of that 10 hour sampling effort. Um, and um, the, what we, the point we were trying to make here was that we, um, although we were super excited and we gained, we went from biodiversity information for amphibians and reptiles, we went from zero to maybe 60 or 70%. The point we really wanted to make with this paper was that these curves never leveled off. They were continuing to increase. They were continuing to go up right to our last day in the park. And what that told us was that this area was not completely surveyed. That what we really wanted to do in the future was come back and, and resurvey that area. And because it was a national park, that was a really important message because often administrators, um, if a team of biologists come into a national park, a protected area, and they collect specimens, and they do a survey work, the temp people are tempted to say, well, that survey has already been done and you, now we know everything we need to know about this area. And we are very interested in providing the, the protected area with a complete information packet about the amphibians and reptiles of their area, but what it was clear to us was that these accumulation curves were continuing to rise and we never got to the total. It was very clear to us that we hadn't sampled this, uh, we had not surveyed this uh, sufficiently, and that we, what we really needed to do was come back and, and focus on this for at least a double of that sampling effort. We had not adequately and completely surveyed the area. So it was, our recommendation was we want to come back next year and do it again. So um, here's the area, um, this little area in Aurora province. And so I ended that, here's Aurora, uh, National, the Aurora National Park is right there. And I ended that, the last, the, en the, the end of our, our the, the punchline from our first survey, survey was we want to come back next year and do this again and do it properly. And so next year turned into 2010. Um, so that's a, a good lesson here. Even with the best of intents, we didn't get back until 13 or 14 years later. Um, but luckily we did go back um, and I really wanted to follow up on this. And we worked in some slightly different areas. We did the same thing with a sort of constraining our sampling effort, or I should say I use the data that were constrained to 20 hours a day. Um, and we looked at those species accumulation curves again, and we're going to talk more about species accumulation curves and how you analyze these types of data tomorrow. Um, and eventually these, cur these curves did level off over, uh, 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 what represented basically only 10 or 12 more days 
of surveying, and we found 35 new species that we had missed before. Not new taxa, some of them were new taxa, but we found 35 on top of our, whatever it was, what did I say, 50 species? Yeah, um, yeah, 50 species, we found another 35 species. So we, you know, the, the increase in, in taxa was, in number of taxa was really striking to us. Um, and so we published an additional paper following up on those earlier surveys and tried to, you know, send the message that we thought we had characterized the data up to maybe 90% or 95% um, for, this, for this area. And we did it, we emphasized the ways in which we did it. So how did we find these additional 35 species from the same general site? I mean, that's really striking. Well, the answer is we went at a different time of year. We went in the beginning of the rainy season, and that's when all the amphibians are starting to breed, so they're detectable. You can hear the frog calls. Um, but it's also the time when the snakes that eat frogs are coming out. They're much more abundant and much more detectable because they're out feeding all the time on the, on the abundance of frogs that are around. Um, and it's just a shift in the season provided some additional, some additional, um, additional species. But we also focused on these new camps. And the, the thing that was interesting was that we were in camps that were only five or maybe 10 at the most kilometers from our original site. They weren't very far away, but they had you know, up to a third or even more different species composition. And so why is that possible? Well, we were just in different streams, like the next stream over on the same mountain, and we found different species. And we focused on different microhabitats. We focused on different substrates, different types of ground. Rather than just being in a river valley, we also surveyed up on the top of dry ridges. And rather than being just in um, a particular type of geological formation, we surveyed in limestone areas. And rather than just being in rivers and streams, we focused in swamps. So we just focused in slightly different microhabitats and we, you know, we uh, greatly increased the known biodiversity for this area. And it went from one of these sites that had 50 or 60 species, which seems about average for this part of the northern Philippines, to what one of our most biodiverse sites for amphibians and reptiles of about 85 species. So it was a real lesson for me. I mean, we, we went back basically to the same place and just moved around a little bit and did it at a different time of year, and boom, we got you know, all this additional diversity, some new species, but mostly there were things that we just didn't detect before, because we only came at a certain time of year, under certain atmospheric conditions, and we went to a particular set of microhabitats. And then we made an effort to switch that up, and we greatly increased the diversity. So this is one of these stories that I really focus on as a lesson for me, at least, on how we can never assume that a site has been adequately surveyed with just a single visit. We need to, we need to sample across um, atmospheric conditions across seasons and look at lots of microhabitat, dis, uh, microhabitat um, diversity, especially in amphibians and reptiles, which, unlike birds, are very patchily distributed and occur in little tiny bits of areas. Town has a question. So what would happen I come if over there? we went back to the same sites, literally the same, the same sites? sites so so the town, same right. the original town has a great question, and that's what would happen if you went back to the exact same sites? and reworked the exact same, you know, exact same transect, the exact same sampling areas, the exact same um, areas that you had, that we had surveyed before. That's a great question. Um, I think that if you went there at a different season, you'd get a different suite of species, because if you went in the rainy season, the frogs would be breeding and the snakes that eat frogs would be there, and you might find lizards that occur just in, or also in, in rainy seasons. So seasonal variation, you'd pick that up, but you probably, reinforce your earlier, you know, your earlier um, observations about the species were there, and then you detect that seasonal variation. In this exercise, we were just trying to record the maximum number of species, and we were trying to arrive at that complete inventory goal, so we were also switching up into different microhabitat types, just trying to get more and more species. Um, but that would be a very good question, and that's the subject of the next thing that I want to tell you about, which is what kind of, why, why, my, why might we want to go back to the exact same site and resample the exact same streams that we've already sampled? You know, that again, administrators um, uh, would often, would, would, it's very tempting to say that um, that area has already been sampled. We don't need to go back there again. And the message that I have learned in the years of doing this is almost all of those arguments are wrong. There's always a reason to go back. There's always interesting information. Um, if you go back at a different time of year, you're going to get a different set of species. If you go back and you collect during the day, and the last time you were there it was at night, you're going to get a, a different set of species. And it's very seldom that we um, have a single inventory effort that encapsulates or captures all the information about a community. And, and, and nine times out of ten, the take-home message is 
to know an area for its terrestrial biodiversity completely, we have to go back. It's not even just a good idea, it's actually a requirement that we go back and at least do one or two or three follow-up surveys in a particular area. So, so here are the data, and we'll, again, we're gonna talk more about how you analyze these data, but I just wanted to show you trends. So here are the data from the 1999 survey for snakes and lizards and frogs. And here are the data on the same scale for the 2010 snakes and lizards and frogs. And if you just line them up, you can see how that worked out, right? This is the, the curves that continued up in 1997, and we cut off our survey at 10 days. And then we picked things up again in 2010, and things went all the way up. And those curves eventually leveled off. And in all of those taxa, I mean, if we were there for another 10 days, we'd probably pick up additional species. But at least those curves are starting to look like they're leveling off, which is referred to as an asymptote in a curve. And, um, and we're gonna talk more about those types of things tomorrow, right? Okay, so I wanna switch to another reason why you might wanna go back to the exact same site. And that is natural ecological processes like disturbance. Um, and there are, um, this is a whole nother field in ecology. Um, disturbance ecology and levels of disturbance and frequency of disturbance and how those impact biodiversity and these those issues of disturbance and biodiversity have spawned um, whole theories of, of the, for the production and the maintenance and the increase in, in diversity and how that interfaces with evolutionary biology but for now I just want to focus on one question again here back to the Philippines of course um, this is the Philippines and here are some plots of the centers of major storm events that have hit the Philippines for, town gave me these data, I'm not exactly sure if that was a year, I think that might have been a year. It was one year. It was one year. And so here is the Philippines, and here are a bunch of storms. Um, these are typhoons, so typhoons are um, tropical cyclones, and in this part of the world we refer to them as typhoons, and on the other side of the world we refer to them as hurricanes. Um, but these are tropical cyclones, or, or typhoon, tropical, tropical, ty, tropical cyclones, or typhoons, hitting the Philippines. And for the most part, they go, um, they go in this east to west pattern. And these build up out here in the Pacific, and they hit the Philippines. And they do so between somewhere, usually, between here and here. And the bulk of the typhoon belt hits this central portion of the Philippines in a repeated and predictable fashion. And the ty typhoon belt runs right across the Philippines, and, um, and there's about 20 typhoons a year that hit the Philippines, right in this section of about between here, whoa, okay, between here and here. And when you talk to um, the, the grandparents and the great-grandparents of my friends in the Philippines now, um, most of them refer to how the typhoon belt has been shifting north during their lifetime. And people talk about how uh, typhoons used to hit down here in the southern islands, and now they're hitting in these areas up here, closer and closer to big cities in the north. So we think that these catastrophic weather disturbances are gonna become a, uh, a, a, an increasingly important issue in this part of the world because there's gonna be an increasingly uh, frequent occurrence of these big storms hitting major metropolitan areas and places where there's lots of people and become a very serious health problem for humans. So um, here's a big one, this is um, Typhoon Haiyan, or um, uh, Yolanda is the local name in the Philippines, which made landfall in November 8th in 2013. And this was the strongest tropical cyclone in the history of recorded uh, storm watching in, of mankind in the, in the history of, uh, of humanity to make landfall in a, in a populated area. And it hit right here, right, that part of the Philippines. And you can just see the size of this monster as it approaches the Philippines. Just put that in perspective. It took up you know, all of the southwestern Pacific. It was a huge storm with incredibly fast wind speeds. And these were mapped at, um, and so here's the path that it took right through the middle of the Philippines. Um, and major cities are here that have airports. And you can see Cebu City, Iloilo, Rojas here. Ormoc is a huge city, and Tacloban is right there. So it ran right past or right through a bunch of major cities in the Philippines. Um, and, and where it eventually made landfall was right here in Tacloban City. And, um, and it had an incredible impact. And so here's the, the sort of transect across the wind speeds of, the, of this storm with gusts up to 270 kilometers per hour and sustained winds of 125 kilometers per hour, which is just, you know, a just incredible um, storm. And the islands that are coated in red here had um, high numbers of deaths. And um, these are the plotted storm surges with the darker shadings of red, indicating the, the higher storm surges of up to 
um, three meters or four meters in some islands um, with huge storm surges that came, up, come ash came ashore. And they did so in one area in Tacloban, right here into a major metropolitan area, a big city. So here's Tacloban a few hours before the storm hit. And you can already see that even before the center of the storm is hit, all these trees are being knocked down and people are scrambling out of the way. And, um, and uh, it became, um, it was, uh, uh, within a period of a couple hours, it became clear that this was going to be one of the biggest storms in history of um, cyclones hitting the, the typhoon belt in the Philippines. And the devastation in, in Tacloban City was incredible. Um, and all, basically the reports were that all of the major um, buildings in this huge bustling city, which is a great big university town where I had spent a lot of time with colleagues, it was a big, um, a great place to go visit with several major colleges and universities, um, were just completely devastated and all the major buildings in the city were damaged severely. Um, and you can see that, da that damage is most in is serious right here in the waterfront when the, the center of the storm really hit before any of the energy was dissipated by the mountains surrounding Tacloban. And just literally all the buildings in these areas were completely destroyed. And it was so powerful that it ripped up roads. I mean, that's, you know, it's not just like knocking down thatch hutches. It actually ripped up cement roads along the shore. And the, the waterfront area was where the bulk of the major destruction was. So it was so powerful. Now, um, so this brings me to the mountain, the forested mountains right behind the city. Um, one of the things that's protected a lot of cities like this on this eastern end of the side of the Philippines is whether they're surrounded by mountains. And these mountains dissipate a lot of the energy of these big storms, but Tacloban was on the east side. And so it took the brunt of this storm that made a perfect hit and represented sort of the perfect, you know, the, the perfect storm of disaster for the Philippines. But these are areas with big, um, what had been big, intact, um, multi-layered um, climax forests. And you can just see, this is a view that I took in last summer, um, um, the, the ridges here are now exposed. A lot of those trees are down. You can see the exposed trunks of a lot of those, um, of those what had previously been intact forest. Um, and, there's, and there's refugees making uh, temporary shelters all along these areas. Um, but, and the trees that are down here are completely dead and exposed. And, and whole tracts of forest were just completely destroyed. And in some areas, when you travel around, you can really see it. Like all the trunks, everything's dead, and all the trunks are all laying in the same area. It was a lot like the famous um, um, volcano eruption in the United States, Mount St. Helens. So um, again, here's that path of the storm right through the central Philippines. Um, and again, we had basically this transect of different levels of wind speeds and thus levels of destruction to the forests going along in north to south with the central core of the storm going 150 kilometer, kilometers per hour wind speeds and then somewhere around 60 to 75 wind speeds as you got farther north and farther south, and then somewhere around 40 to 50 kilometers per hour wind speeds as you got really far north and really far south. So it represents this kind of interesting gradient of disturbance right across the central Philippines.